host and executive producer of CIO, which airs on Friday nights on PBS 12. I am joined tonight by Axios Denver reporter Elena Alvarez and also Eric Sonderman, columnist for Colorado Politics and the Denver Gazette. Both are regular contributing panelists to CIO. The three of us will be asking all the candidates questions tonight. The order of which our 10 candidates are seated on the stage was determined completely by random, a random drawing. There is a wider field in this race for Denver's mayor, but PBS 12 and our partners agreed to pick the top 10 candidates based on individual and self contributions to campaigns. Okay, Eric, let's get started. Let's get started indeed. Welcome everyone. Uh, one of you we will be addressing as mayor here a few months down the road and uh, let's have a good encounter tonight. We will start by just asking each of you to give us one word, one single word that you think best describes the current condition of our city. We'll start and go down the line. Ian Tafoya. Growing pains. Leslie Harrod. Opportunity. Debbie Ortega. Action. Trinidad Rodriguez. Need. Andy Rougeau. Struggling. Kwame Spearman. Neighborhoods. Kelly Bruff. Promise. Lisa Calderon. Chris Hansen. Potential. And Mike Johnston. Vibrant. Thank you all. Moving into our first topic of the night, we would like each of you to discuss a new poll first reported by Axios Denver this week. You'll have 30 seconds to respond, and this time we're going to start with Mike Johnston and go down the line to Ian Tafoya. The poll released this week shows that 60% of voters in Denver are undecided when it comes to who they will vote for, and not a single candidate is polling above 10%. Mike Johnston. Why do you think you aren't resonating more with voters, and how do you plan to sway them in the short amount of time that you have left before Election Day? You have 30 seconds. I think voters have been trying to pay attention to this race. It's been a busy cycle. It's been a cold winter. If you've learned out realizing this race is coming much more quickly, and I think as we see that attention increase, people are going to look at who is the candidate they think can most deliver solutions on the hardest problems. I think for me, those top issues are how do we tackle homelessness and how do we take on affordable housing in the city. I've spent the last two years working on that issue as the CEO of a foundation here and helping pass Proposition 123, which is the first statewide ballot measure to take this issue on. I think voters are going to see my leadership in the nonprofit, private, and public sector as positioned to do that. Chris Hansen, your response. Yeah, thank you. I think Mike's exactly right. I think voters are just now starting to tune in, and it's great to have these forums to really start to reach the into every corner of Denver, uh, let them get to know us, because that's exactly what we need. The top issues are clear. The voters are super concerned out of the poll that you mentioned. Public safety and tackling the homelessness crisis are at the top of that list, and that's exactly what I plan to focus on in this race. And I think we're going to use every tool we have, uh, whether it be door knocking, mail, reaching out through advertising. We've got to reach every part of this town. Lisa Calderon, what does it say to you that only six or 60 percent have no idea who they're going to vote for? How do you make sense of that? And how are you planning to stand out? So, thank you. First of all, I don't buy the results of that poll. It was a Republican backed by the business community. We've seen two polls that hold the women of color uh, in the top uh, p uh, contenders. So I think that goes to that we have deep roots in these communities. Uh, who are you polling? Who are you asking? And so it's up to us to make sure that we get the, our community people out there. Thank you. Kelly Braff, your response. Thank you. Uh, I'm not surprised that 60% haven't decided. Uh, I think voters are just starting to pay attention and they have a lot of choice. Uh, for me, I think why they're going to be very interested in Kelly Bruff is two reasons. My personal experience relates to the issues we face today. My professional experience has prepared me for this office. I'm not interested in another office, and I think that will be very appealing to the voters of Denver. Thank you. Kwame Spearman. How can you get people excited to learn about this race? We're hearing from other candidates that uh, people are just now learning about, about what's going on. How are you going to get them excited? So the first thing I wanted to say is actually a lot of my friends call me undecided. So I actually think I'm polling at 60%. Just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> You actually hit the reason why I jumped in the race. I think we need fresh energy in this city. Most of the people who are sitting on this stage, they've either served or we know their name. And so the fact that people aren't sold on them tells us what I think everyone in this audience already knows. This is a generational change. 
we need fresh leadership. And I think I've got a vision for that because I care about our neighborhoods. And I'm so excited to talk to you about my neighborhood vision Thank today. Thank you. Andy Rizzo, your response. So I'm not a politician like the other people on the stage. So I'm not surprised they don't know who I am. But I am a veteran. I'm a small business owner. I'm a father of two little girls. And I'm running for mayor to fight for Denver's future, to add 400 police officers, to enforce our camping ban, to, hate, to make housing more affordable in our city. And I'm sure when voters hear that there's someone who's different from the other people on the stage, someone who's experienced actually delivering in the time in the military, delivering as a small business owner, they're going to know who I am, they're going to vote for me. Thank you. Trinidad Rodriguez, your response. Well, I also have serious concerns about the nature of the poll itself. Frankly, the insiders in Denver politics have been wrong in most of the most important elections in our history. And we're at another essentially important time. Is this the city I want to leave to my daughter? I think when Denverites ask themselves that exact same question, they will start to get uh, excited and will focus on, what, on this race immediately. Thank you. Debbie Ortega, you've been in office for decades. I'm curious how you make sense of, you know, as such a well-established name in Denver, why aren't you pulling above 10% yet? So first of all, we dug into this and learned that it was white voters who were the people that were reached out to, not all voters in Denver. And I think when you do a poll across the city, you need to reach out to all people. So part of the reason why I'm here is because I think now more than ever, this city needs someone who knows how this city works, has been involved in big and small projects, and has worked in the trenches with our communities and has been successful. And I don't think that this is a time when um, there are some great people on this stage that, that are looking to this city, but it really is an important time for someone who knows how the city works and can get things done. Thank you. And that's what I'm here to do. Thank you. Yeah. Leslie Harrod, your response. Yeah, you know, I agree with a lot that's been said on stage, but what I will just add is that um, we know the voters in Denver are smart. They are informed and they want to do their research. When they see a ballot with 17 people on it, it's pretty overwhelming. When they hear a poll and it takes five minutes to get through all the names, that's a lot. And so they're saying they're undecided, rightfully so, because they want to do their research. The great thing about Denver is that we have mail ballots. We have a lot of opportunity for people to spend time to vote, and they will do that research before casting the ballot. And I Thank know you. the voters of Denver will make the right choice. Thank you. Thank you. Ian Tafoya, your response. How are you going to stand out right now at the crowded field? What's your plan? Well, I think that the voters of Denver have showed us that they agree with the policies I've been working on. Waste no more, they voted 71%. Climate crisis is the number one issue for so many people, whether you have children or you're young yourself. I think it's an exciting time. I hope that people have seen my electric bicycles riding around with signs to raise up my name ID. I want to invite everybody next Saturday to a Denver Rocks the Vote concert at the Mercury Cafe. We're using the arts, the excitement, the voters are with us. And when they look into homelessness and climate crisis, they know that I've been the one acting on it. Thank you. Thank you. You all are such good sharers. We don't need to pass the microphone. That is for you to hold on to, Lisa. We're gonna bring that over to you. So yeah, Lisa's microphone here is a little off, so you just hold on to that. No more sharing. <laughs> all right, we are gonna move on to a topic of safety now. As you all have brought up, safety in Denver is an issue. You will have 45 seconds to respond to our questions, and we will be calling on you individually, okay? Kwame Spearman. A poll released earlier this week showed that Denver residents are feeling increasingly uneasy and on edge about crime. In your assessment, what factors have led to the growing insecurity? Kyle, I, I agree with you and I agree with the poll. Our, our residents deserve safe neighborhoods. And, and if you walk around the city, and if you talk to our residents, people are not feeling safe right now. I think there are three things we've got to do. The first, and it's crazy that we have to say this, we've got to enforce our laws. We've stopped doing that. We've passed policies that have made it harder to enforce our laws, and quite frankly, we've got to change the, the culture of our police officers to enforce laws. The second thing we've got to do is empower those individuals to get the job done. We've got to do more with mental health professionals, but we've got to enforce our laws. And the third thing is we need to think incredibly critically about if we've passed some policies that are making our city less safe. I believe we have, and as mayor, I look forward okay. to taking a stance that's gonna get us back on crime. All right, Kwame, thank you. 
Chris Hansen, I would like to direct that question to you as well. What, what is behind in your assessment of people feeling uneasy and nervous about going downtown and in through neighborhoods throughout Denver? Yeah, absolutely. It's certainly downtown, but it's spread out throughout every neighborhood of Denver. And people are feeling uneasy because we're seeing an increase in the crime rate. We are seeing discernible change in where Denver is compared to where we were a few years ago. And there's some very clear reasons for that. First of all, our public safety department is understaffed. The sheriff's office right now is down between 30 and 40% of where it should be. The police department is down between 15 and 20% of where it should be. So when someone calls 911, it might be a long wait time and then it might be an hour before an officer gets to your house. That's simply unacceptable. So the, as the next mayor, I will prioritize rebuilding our public safety department. All of our great plans in every other area of policy and housing, et cetera, are not gonna work if we don't rebuild public safety. Thank you. Lisa Calderon, as you know, killings in Denver remain above pre-pandemic levels and shootings are on the rise. Last year, the city banned ghost guns and concealed carry weapons in public buildings and in parks. What policies, if any, would you pursue as mayor to curb gun violence? So we need a public health approach to looking at uh, why are guns being used, uh, especially among young people. Um, the fact that, I mean, I grew up in a time when we had gangs, but uh, it was also the first generation where young people were shooting each other. And so the age that is most um, uh, complex is at 16 to 24 year old. A lot of our programs are geared toward younger children or adults. And so we need to understand why do kids not feel safe? Why do they feel like that they don't have a future? I'm in support of tougher uh, gun laws. Um, I support uh, the legislation against ghost guns, uh, but we really do need to take a public health approach to this problem. Andy Rougeau, same question. How do we curb gun violence in this city? So crime is out of control in our city. We've seen almost a tripling of murders in the past 10 years. But my next door neighbor had four people jump their fence on Christmas Eve, try to pry open the back door. That is a memory he is gonna have the rest of his life, sitting on 911 on hold on Christmas Eve. That family will always remember that. That's why as mayor, I'll add 400 police officers to make sure our city is properly staffed. I will better increase funding for police training to make sure our officers have the training they need. I will probably fund our 911 system because right now if you call, there's a 25% chance you're gonna sit on hold for more than 30 seconds. One of the worst moments in your life, you will sit on hold. As mayor, I'll fight for our future by adding those officers and by fixing a broken system. Trinidad Rodriguez, you've talked a lot about Denver's police force being quote unquote far too small. Amid nationwide officer recruitment challenges, how exactly would you draw in more police officers? Would you raise their salaries, offer hiring bonuses? Please be specific. Yeah, first step is actually supporting our police from the very top of our city government, meaning the mayor's office. So I will support the uh, police in our city and public safety in our city. Second is improving the job. The way we improve the job is by uh, bolstering training and actually recruiting and building specialized teams where people's interests are actually aligned with the job they're doing when they are working in public safety. So expanding on ideas like the STAR program, but even for even more um, critical teams. When our police force is far too small, the first thing that gets cut is community safety and other prevention programs. Uh, and uh, I wanna restore those types of prevention programs so crime doesn't happen in the first place throughout our city. Thank you. Leslie Harrod. Do you agree Denver's police force is too small? And if so, how do you intend to bolster it? My dad is a law enforcement officer, retired after 30 years of working uh, in Southern Colorado. He started as a groundskeeper at Supermax Prison and worked his way up to the head of internal investigations. Uh, I know firsthand what it feels like when uh, you don't know if your loved one is gonna come home that night, possibly because there is a lockdown or other safety issues in their uh, workplace. The Denver Sheriff's Office is understaffed today. Um, we are at uh, unsafe conditions right now within the, within the Sheriff's Office and the police are also understaffed. We need to ensure that we fill those vacancies and we fill them with people who are trained and who are willing to serve and protect our communities. That's a priority. Thank you. 
Pivoting just a tad, uh, we have two quick yes and no questions on the topic of public safety for the entire group. Everyone will answer at the same time through a show of hands, and Kyle will tally the results. The first question, considering Denver's surge in crime has gone largely unabated, you all have acknowledged this on stage, raise your hand if you would replace Ron Thomas as the city's police chief. Andy Rougeau. Would you pursue replacing him as police chief? Candidates, including him. Andy Rougeau says he definitely would replace Ron Thomas. Thank you. Second question. Shot Spotter, a gunshot detection technology used by Denver police, has come under fire for its effectiveness and its impact on communities of color. Uh, in 2022, the city voted to extend its Shot Spotter contract through 2026. Please raise your hand if you support the city's decision. Okay, that is everyone except for Lisa Calderon, Leslie Herod, and Nia Tafoya. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have a few more detail-oriented questions to ask as well about safety. Uh, so now we'll call on you individually again. You have 45 seconds to answer. Mike Johnson, what will you do as mayor to limit or mitigate the volume of six and seven digit legal sediments that taxpayers are paying out due to allegations of police misconduct? This is why you have to make sure you have the right police chief with the right culture in the organization. I think what we want to do is change the role of policing, which is less about people in military vests inside of squad cars driving around and more about people out on the beat, walking in communities, engaging in relationships, talking to residents, giving them their cards, talking to business owners and community members, and about attracting people to the profession that are drawn to that kind of community service and that feel that those relationships are where you find the power. So we want to both attract a police force that believes that, we want to build a culture of people who want to be community public servants, and of course we'll hold people accountable who break that trust. You are given the public trust to serve and protect. Uh, if you don't, you have to lose that badge and you have to find someplace else to work. Okay, thank you. Debbie Ortega, I'd like to ask the same question as you. You've been with the city during this time where you paid out some big settlements. What would be different? So one of the things I think we need to get back to is community policing. During the summer of 92 when we had uh, a lot of crime and violence among our young people, um, this process of getting people from our police department working in the neighborhoods made a huge difference. And where we had barriers between the community and police where there was a breakdown in communication, we significantly changed that. And I think we need to get back to that so that we don't have these kinds of payouts that we've seen in the past. Thank you. Kelly Bruff, in recent televised debates, we've seen a show of hands among candidates uh, as to whether you support or oppose the legislature's action to re-felonize the possession of fentanyl. But we really haven't heard from candidates, so I'd like to ask you if you would take 45 seconds to articulate your position on this issue. Um, so just a reminder of, I think it was just this last session a year ago, uh, that uh, one gram was made um, a felony. Uh, and I think it was very tense and a lot of uh, discussion about it. For me, I look at fentanyl and it's really clear that it's a death sentence, uh, a poison, and it's destroying people in our community at record numbers. So I struggle with this discussion now that talks about taking it back, uh, where we wouldn't recognize how devastating it is. So I do support the law that's been put in place um, and maintaining the felony. And Ian Tafoya, same question on the refelonization of fentanyl. I'm not in agreement with felonizing drug use and possession. The drug war is a failed drug war. I had an opportunity to spend a couple years of my life working on a film called Public Enemy Number no. One that followed the drug war. We won the LA Documentary Film Festival. It wastes our resources and it doesn't target it where we need to target, which is helping people get into treatment. And we also need to be targeting the people who are the dealers. Thank you. We now like to ask a question from Northfield High School student Abby Jones, who is a youth representative to the PBS 12 Content Consortium. Each of you will have 30 seconds to respond. We'll start again with Ian and go down the line in that direction. Abby would like to know what you, the candidates, think is the most pressing issue facing Denver adolescents. She and her friends find it interesting, she says, to hear adult views on what they think, that teens think, is important 
And I just add here a note that the three of us found this question from Abby to pr be particularly timely given recent events at East High, as well as the swatting threats uh, to schools all over the state, very threatening threats and frightening threats over the last few days. Ian, you're up. Well, you know, I'm an educator. I started my career as teaching before I went on to work for three branches of local government. Just yesterday and the day before, I was teaching thousands of students in Longmont about agriculture and civics. I'm happy to be endorsed by Maud Michatur, the state's leading young environmental activist. Yes, we have issues with gun violence and bullying and mental health, but the dread that the youth have around climate crisis is so real, and it's why I've dedicated my career to it. I've had a lot of conversations with youth recently and throughout my entire career. I started as a youth activist, and I believe that young people's voices are very important. So thank you so much for asking that question. Um, right now, what I'm hearing the most from our young people, and I think we know this, is that they're feeling unsafe. Uh, gun violence makes them feel unsafe to go to school every day. And unfortunately, some of our kids are armed when they're going to school. Um, it's terrifying, the situations that we're living in right now. For, for young people, for teachers, for educational support professionals, we've got to do more to curb youth violence, and we've got to listen to the youth for those solutions. This week, um, young people were at Denver City Council testifying from East High School about their concern about their safety in their school, and they were asking for police resource officers to be brought back into their school. Not every school wants a police resource officer, I think this is where we, the school, uh, school board and city council and the mayor and superintendent need to come together, listen to community, listen to our students and teachers so that we are addressing those issues as they would like to see them addressed within their school environment. But in that particular school, that's what they want. Thank you. I'm an East High Angel and it broke my heart to see the, tra the two tragedies in Denver Public Schools. Uh, recently, and my view is that while a single death is far too many of our youth at the hands of gun violence or other violence, the reality is the trauma that uh, per is pervasive around that uh, and the loss of life through suicide and overdose and so many other uh, terrifying factors that uh, coordinating and creating a relationship between our city and Denver Public Schools. Thank you. Crime is the big, biggest issue facing our children. It's the biggest issue facing my two girls. There was a father and a daughter that are driving home, coming back from volleyball practice, and the dad looked in his rearview mirror, he saw two cars zooming. It was street racers. They shot at each other and blew out the windows to that car. That's unacceptable. That's why we need a mayor who will be different from the current politicians standing on the stage we'll add 400 police officers, we'll enforce our laws, we'll make sure our 911 system works, and that's why I'll do it as mayor fighting for our future. I went to East High School and I own a business that operates across the street from East High School, a bookstore. So the fact that our students cannot go across the street to buy a book without fear of getting shot is horrible. And we've gotta ask ourselves, most of the people on this stage have been running the city for the past five, 10, 15 years. They haven't made it safe. In fact, we've gone the exact opposite direction. What we need right now is a fresh perspective and a fresh voice from a business owner who's having to deal with that same crime, from someone who actually went to that high school. Thank you. Um, I appreciate this question, Abby. Um, I, th I think it's mental health. I think our young people saw a crisis long before we did. Um, and now I think we're responding, but slowly. Uh, Children's Hospital has you know, clearly sounded the alarm uh, as someone who is, as an organization that's been serving kids um, so effectively. But I would also say, I think this is a space where we can listen earlier, uh, longer, and more attentively to what you really need that we can help support you. I'm a college professor at Regis University in CU Boulder, so I talk to young people a lot. And what I hear is dread for their future, um, that once they're done graduating, will they be able to afford a home? Will they be able to live in Denver? Um, student debt is crushing them. Uh, it's one of the reasons I'm running, because I want them to feel like they have a future. Um, we're seeing with girls higher rates of anxiety and sexual harassment and assault. And so we want them to feel safe as well. And so we need to create an equitable future for all of our students. 
This is such an important question for me and it strikes very close to home. I'm raising two teenage boys in our wonderful city. My oldest is a sophomore at GW. He was on lockdown the same day there was the shooting at East. He was in lockdown twice more in the first semester. My eighth grader at McAuliffe had one of his classmates get shot 12 years old. So what is the number one issue? Our kids don't feel safe right now. And I'm feeling it at home and I'm seeing it on our, our streets and we're seeing it on the news every single night. I am proud to sponsor the bill right now to end ghost guns in Colorado, joined with Senator Fields from Aurora. We're gonna get it done this session. Think about your seventh and eighth grade year, right? You wake up in the morning, you go to school, sit at the lunch table, talk to your friends. After school, you go to football practice, you go to a dance on Friday night, you go to the playground, you hang out on a Saturday with all your friends. Then think about losing all of that for two entire years of your life. Think about having access to none of the things that sustain you. And why are we surprised when our kids are seeing massively elevated levels of depression, of anxiety, all the things that hold you together at age 13 and 14, we took away for two years. The major crisis is mental health. We have to now respond by making sure we give our kids the support they're gonna need to get out of what none of us could have ever anticipated or lived through ourselves. Thank you all for your thoughtful responses. Thank you. Uh, now we have a few more yes, no questions for you. Per Moody's Analytics in the fourth quarter of 2022, the average asking monthly rent in the Denver metro area was $1,744. That's up 9.3% from the year earlier. Please raise your hand if you would push for the imposition of rent control if authorized by the state legislature. Okay, we have Ian Tavoya and Lisa Calderon saying yes. Thank you. Since the two terms, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Debbie. Are there any explanations on any of these? Because Denver does have our own form of rent control since the legislature gave that authority back to Denver. So you say yes to rent control? To what we have in place today. Okay. Yes. I, I support rent stabilization. I do support rent stabilization. I think it's a part of a package of solutions for Denver. Rent stabilization. Thank you. All right. Here's a question. Since two years is good enough to, excuse me, <laughs> Two terms is sufficient for our President of the United States, and two terms is good for the Colorado Governor. Raise your hand if you will commit to limiting yourself to more than two years as mayor. Two terms, goodness gracious, Kyle. No more than two terms. You got it. No more than two terms. No more than two terms. Everyone but Andy Rougeau. I'm sorry, two terms, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next question, still yes or no. Uh, raise your hand if you believe current resources to help people experiencing homelessness are insufficient and if Denver needs to spend additional dollars beyond those currently allocated for housing and services for the unhoused. Okay, Lisa Calderon, Ian Tafoya, and Trinidad Rodriguez, and Leslie Harrod. Thank you. Great, another question. Please raise your hand if you believe it is the job of the mayor to carry out the voters' express directions, and accordingly, if you will enforce the voter-approved camping ban. Okay, everyone except for Lisa Calderon, Leslie Harrod, and Antifoya. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Now we are moving into a conversation about housing and homelessness in Denver. You will be called upon directly for specific questions. Each of you will have 45 seconds to respond. Eric is starting us off. And Kelly Bruff is starting us off here. Clearly Denver is a compassionate city and wants to do right by those homeless individuals and families living here. But how do you balance the rights of the homeless with the rights also of others who live and work here? What is your sense of that balance and how would you approach it? Yeah, uh, Eric, I, I probably don't see it as a uh, balance. I see um, treating people who are unhoused uh, humanely as achieving the goal that uh, helps everybody's living conditions improve. So in my first year in office, I would end unsanctioned camping. And instead, I would get people indoors or to sanctioned camping sites with supports and services that they desperately need while we build the housing and shelter um, that, that we need to build as a region. I wouldn't do it as a loan. I would build it with the region. Five sitting mayors in the metropolitan area have endorsed my homeless plan and me as a candidate. I'd use data and prevention to have a real impact on the challenges we face today. And Lisa Calderon, the same question. Do you regard it as a balance and what is your approach to that question? 
So I've been a 20-year uh, service provider, including for domestic violence victims who find themselves homeless and people coming out of jail who find themselves homeless. It is not compassionate to threaten to arrest people or involuntarily commit them. It is also not evidence-based. Uh, and, and the fact that we're putting the responsibility all on individuals as if we are not looking at systemic breakdowns, we are not looking at the cycle of wealth and poverty in this city, which has increased over COVID. So I would replace the street uh, enforcement team with crisis intervention responders. I would stop the sweeps and instead get people into housing, enact master leases, uh, rent, eviction assistance, et cetera, the whole gamut we need, including social housing. Thank you. A question for Mike Johnston. As if more evidence was needed, a poll released this week, the poll Elena referenced earlier by a group of startup business leaders showed that 96% of Denver voters believe the issue of homelessness is either, quote, a crisis or, quote, a major problem. Do you support what is often referred to as a housing first model for addressing homelessness? And if so, how does that work for those individuals who are suffering from pronounced mental illness or pronounced substance abuse issues? Yeah, first, Eric, no one should be homeless in Denver. We have a moral obligation to solve this problem, and we know how to do it. And what's required here is to get people into stable, safe, and protected housing. That's why what I would do is build micro communities where you have 40 to 50 tiny homes that offer uh, stability, offer a, a bed, offer heat. Uh, and then in those communities, you can actually offer the wraparound services we know people need. Then you can push in addiction support. You can push in mental health support. You can push in workforce training and long-term housing support. It's far more efficient and far more effective to be able to serve people in places where they're safe and stable and taken care of. That's what we ought to do to be able to do this. Then we ought to convert our county jail system to actually be able to do what we needed to do now, which is close two of those pods and open one for long-term addiction treatment and one for mental health support, knowing that's what people actually need when they get sent to prison where they can't get that treatment. Kwame Spearman, same question. Uh, your comments, please. I think the reason why you've got people who've served in office here that aren't getting the support of Denverites is we're not having tough conversations on this. There are a segment of people who are unhoused who are trying to get back into housing, and we've got to do everything in our power for those individuals. We've got to innovate. We've got to have housing options for them. But at the same time, we've got to be honest with ourselves because we are not enforcing our laws. We've become a magnet for people who want to be chronically homeless. And that's got to change on day one. So we've got to enforce our laws. We've got to provide innovation for those who want to have a path into homes. But we've got some really, really tough choices because I, I respectfully, I don't think everyone's just going to walk into a housing option or a shelter if we give them that opportunity. Thank you. Trinidad Rodriguez, can you point to one or more major city uh, that is dealing with homelessness in a more effective way than Denver. What is the key to that success? And do those cities spend more or less per homeless individual than, current, than Denver currently does? In my experience, the cities that do the best by the people experiencing homelessness are in Asia and Europe. And frankly, the cultural differences and economic models are so fundamentally different from what we have in the U.S that it's almost impossible to replicate and pick up. That's why my plan calls for initially declaring a state of emergency on the most urgent and uh, part of our homeless challenge, which is people living and dying in, on our streets unhoused. The second step is to expand treatment access, and in particular for people who are uh, of danger to themselves or others, provide involuntary commitment of those individuals. And I'm, I've started to hear uh, other folks finally start to adopt the same view. Okay, Trinidad, thank you. Ian Tafoya, same question. Is there another city or multiple cities that seem to be doing a better job at meeting the needs of those who are living in homelessness? I think homelessness is a crisis all across the country. And I think some of the programs that have been led by the mutual aid communities here in Denver are actually nation leading. I founded the Headwaters Protectors who is taking the very first step of providing public health and sanitation to individuals in compassion and humanity. I offered a plan to the mayor to scale the safe outdoor sites using unemployed cultural workers. And we offered a summit that brought together people in the trades, constructions, arts, 
Office of Emergency Management to talk about how we're gonna convert and build these housing that we need desperately after we get people stability so they can get continuity of care that we've been talking so much about. People also need to realize that you can't just say we're gonna offer wraparound services without also giving opportunities to build more therapists and social workers. We have to be supporting our colleges to build those career paths too. Ian, thank you. Chris Hansen. U.S. Census data shows that Colorado in general is becoming more diverse of a population except for Denver. Denver is getting whiter and wealthier, and with a dearth of affordable housing, many in diverse communities are having to leave Denver. How do you analyze this problem, and how is Mayor Will you stop this trend? Yeah, Kyle, it's a very important question because you know, literally the fabric of our neighborhoods is being uh, stressed out by the gentrification and displacement that you mentioned from the U.S. Census data. And I think the driving reason of it is a huge shortage of supply on housing. You know, the estimates that I've seen are that we're at least 50,000 units behind where we need to be right now. That puts huge upward pressure on rents all across the city, uh, pushes people out of neighborhoods. We have to catch up in a serious way. And I think one of the best opportunities we have in Denver is high density on our major corridors. So East Colfax, Broadway, Federal, et cetera, and make sure we connect that high density, the new builds we can do there, across the different income levels, across the different price points, connect it with transit. And that's gonna be a super important part to make sure our city works, new housing, close to transit. Chris Hansen. Leslie Herod, I'd like to ask you that question as well. How do you re reverse the trend of people having to move out of their communities? Yeah, affordability is, is what's happening right now. It is too expensive to live in Denver for most families. It's why together um, I led the effort to create the Middle Income Housing Authority. We know today that teachers, firefighters, nurses, mental health providers can't afford to live in our own communities. In my neighborhood of Park Hill, if I had to buy my home today, I wouldn't be able to represent the district I represent because I couldn't afford it. We need more diverse housing stock across the board, across Denver. It is not okay that we have legacy, legacy communities that can't, their, kid, their grandparents can't afford to live near their grandkids, right? We can't afford to keep our families together anymore. We know that's a huge problem for Denver and displacement is a key factor in that. We've got to get control of this affordability crisis. Everyone deserves to be able to afford to live in our city. Andy Rougeau, this question is for you. In recent years, many out-of-state developers have snatched up property in Denver and data shows that a growing proportion of homes on the market are being bought by investors paying in full cash. All of this drives up home prices. Um, as mayor, how, if at all, will you address this? So our city council and our mayor have failed our city on housing, but they've failed our city by putting roadblocks in the way of building new housing. Great example of this is a failed permitting department, a fact that it takes over a year for some projects to get approved. It's the waitress who commutes from 45 minutes out of town. She can't drop her kids off at school in the morning just to make it to work every day. So I, as mayor, I will fix our broken permitting department. I'll get rid of regulations that increase the cost of building housing. Things like restricting heights of ADUs to one and a half stories, parking spaces minimums. I'm also gonna get our permit department back in person every single day and I'm gonna get money out of the process because right now, corruption and money is buying our zoning decisions. That's unacceptable. And as mayor, I'll fight for our future by changing that. Thank you. Debbie Ortega, Andy Rajo just mentioned city council has failed the city. I'm curious how you, uh, well, number one, if you agree with that as a city council member for years, um, and how you would address the dearth of affordable housing and, and out-of-state developers, you know, snatching up all our property. The real bottom line is the cost of land and the cost of housing has, has skyrocketed in terms of being able to build it. No doubt that the permitting process has exacerbated bringing it online much quicker. But the reality is it, it takes a, a series of funding stack of dollars to be able to bring online affordable units so we get them down more affordable. So my goal is to be building manufactured housing that can be built all across the metro area, including in Denver. We need to look at public lands that are available and to work with our nonprofits as well. They're the ones that do the lion's share of the affordable units. We have been able to extract some through community benefit agreements from large developments, but those are typically at the higher AMI levels. We need to be able to meet the needs of all different price points that don't exist in this city that used to exist at one time. Thank you. Switching gears just a little bit, uh, this next question comes in partnership with the Colorado Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. 
You'll each have 45 seconds for your responses. Here's the first question. Denver Latinos make up 29% of the population, but Latino-owned small businesses are underrepresented with city contracts. Meanwhile, the certification to become a minority-owned business is cumbersome and a barrier for small business owners. As the future mayor, uh, what will you do to streamline and strengthen the process for minority-owned businesses and offer more opportunities to have minority-owned businesses at the forefront of capital projects and city-funded opportunities? Trinidad Rodriguez, let's start with you and move in order to the left. So we'll go to Ian and then back to Mike Johnston. Trinidad. Thank you. Thank you for the question to the Hispanic Chamber. It is a critical question, and Denver isn't doing enough, nor is the state of Colorado, frankly. Um, one of the fastest growing state economies in the U.S. is California. And while there are a lot of things I wouldn't do like California, their efforts around increasing equity as it relates to um, purchasing and, and contracting and partnerships with diverse communities far exceeds what we're doing here in Denver. I know this because I was an investment banker for 23 years and saw what, it, what the implications were when a state was actually committed to advancing uh, communities of color in, uh, in these corporate fields. So and there were actual direct investments by units of government in that state. Yeah. You repeat the question, please. Uh, yes, so as the future mayor, what will you do to streamline and strengthen the process for minority-owned businesses and offer more opportunities to have minority-owned businesses at the forefront of capital projects and city-funded opportunities? So one of the um, things the city has right now is the Herman Malone Fund. Uh, this is funding that is available to support small and minority businesses, to help them with technical assistance, to bring online more businesses. There are a number of resources available. Uh, oftentimes, especially during COVID, a lot of our minority businesses did not know about these resources. Um, and I think it's a matter of making sure people in our community who are small and minority businesses know what those resources are that are available to them. We have an economic development office that does a lot of this work. We have a small business office that helps do the certifications and provides the technical assistance. We need to make sure that we're creating every opportunity to connect people to these resources that are available Thank so they you. can be successful in accessing contracts with the city. Thank you. Leslie Herod. You know, I think this is an important question, and it's one that we've been talking about trying to tackle for quite some time. Uh, number one, we need to make sure that those small business navigators that the councilwoman just talked about are actually located in our communities. Um, when I see uh, all of the, the, the for sale or the closed signs in, in, um, on the north side, the west side, on Welton Street, it's because they haven't been invested in. They didn't have access to those resources. They didn't know that those resources existed. And then when they did finally apply, they didn't qualify because many of the minority-owned businesses are sole proprietorships, they're family-owned, and they don't have the same investment as other businesses. So the other thing that we would do as the city of Denver is bring more access to capital for these small businesses. Small businesses are the lifeblood of our economy, and it should be communities of color that are able to benefit and thrive from that economy as well. We've got to get them access to capital. Thank you. Ian Tafoya, how do you plan to support small minority businesses? Well, I really appreciate this question. My treasurer, Veronica Barella, actually formed a group that's called uh, the Committee for City and Airport Fairness that for years and years has been trying to push the city to actually match their goals on what we're uh, bringing on minority-owned businesses and women-owned businesses. We've really struggled with the city to find that data. I've had strong conversations with Phil Washington from the airport talking about how can we make sure not only that we're building the businesses, yes, we're providing them capital. I am a huge supporter of public banking. I hope we can pass it at the state level because I do believe public banking can pay more money back to our communities. We also need to make sure that we're creating certifiable green businesses. And lastly, and this is a big one, there are so many uh, groups, especially minority groups, that struggle to move from a sub to a prime contractor. We need to be the people building the community and our infrastructure in our own communities. Mike Johnson. Uh, I apologize. I'm going to answer a different question. I want to come back to this homelessness question because uh, about a couple of days ago, I'm standing outside a homeless shelter at 6 a.m. with folks waiting in line for breakfast. And I'm talking to a guy, and I noticed he's got a hard hat in his bag. And I said, are you working construction? He said, yeah, after... 11 months, this is my first night having to stay in a shelter. He said, I'm a, I'm a veteran, I served two tours. Uh, I got out and I was 
addicted for a while. I've now got clean and I'm doing methadone, but I do construction. You gotta be at the site every morning at 5.30. But for my, meth my methadone treatment, I also be at the clinic at 5.30. So the two days I have treatment, I have to choose either going to treatment or missing my shift. I went to treatment twice this week, so I missed my shift. That's why I'm back in a shelter. That man does not need to be put in prison. That man does not need to be involuntarily committed. That man needs access to housing. And that's our job to deliver for a veteran and for someone who's trying to make their way in the city. Thank you. Chris Hansen, back to the topic of supporting small uh, minority businesses. Uh, I'll stay right on that question because I think we are at this moment of a once in a life opportunity, life, lifetime opportunity for Denver because of billions of dollars of new construction and investment that's going to be happening in the city in the next mayor's term. It is a result of state support, it's a result of federal legislation, and it's a result of city investment. It's happening at the airport, it's happening downtown, it's happening all over the city, and if we have to get this question right, and I want to double down on where we have started this work with the city and make sure that there are huge opportunities for minority-owned businesses as we take on this huge investment. That is incumbent on the next mayor, and that is exactly what I'll deliver to make sure we're growing great businesses right here, and they get a chance to participate in this massive wave of building our future in Denver. Thank you, Chris. Lisa Calderon. My mic. Okay, here we go. Um, I, too, served on the committee for um, contract fairness, uh, looking at the services, not only just the construction contracts. And what we find is um, a history of discrimination which has impacted how those contracts are given out. That is not an issue of the past. Uh, if you look at some recent stories going on at the airport, for example, uh, we see employees being retaliated, uh, not hearing about um, uh, the investigations going on. So we need to address discrimination in contracting, uh, but also we need to disaggregate our data. When we get data about the contracts in the city, um, all minority businesses are lumped together. We need to look at how uh, women of color, for example, are getting contracts, and they, uh, often the information isn't provided for us. So we need good data. Your response. Opportunity is foundational to the other issues we've been talking about tonight. So I would do the same kind of things I did when I was CEO of the Denver Metro Chamber. In 2018, I created an entire arm of the chamber that focused on nothing else but removing the inequities for women and people of color to start companies. And the interest in, in that is it creates cr huge economic opportunity and we're leaving money on the table. To do it as mayor, what I would do is create what I call the common app, uh, just like we do for college kids where RTD, DPS, CDOT, State of Colorado and the city and county of Denver would have one application for minority women and disadvantaged businesses so we could get to business with you and put your team to work. Thank you. I, I did it in 45 seconds. I'm very proud of myself. Call me Spearman, your response. Th this is exactly why I want to be your neighborhood mayor. The West Side is being gentrified. Our Latino-led businesses are going out of business. And what you've just heard from the politicians who've been up on stage are plans, but what have they done? These problems are occurring and they've kept occurring. We need someone who wants to go into your neighborhood and actually hear from you. And then take what you say and make those the goals of the city. This is personal to me. I'm a small business owner and, and I love everything that people have said, but we are not getting the support that we need. And this is a common theme in Denver. Our politicians are not listening. We've got to change our vision for the city, and we're going to do it by going into our neighborhoods and listening to the residents who make this city great. Yeah. Supporting small businesses, small minority businesses. Andy Rajo, your plan. Yes. So I am a former small business owner. I fix gates for self-storage units, the type of business where at the end of the day I'd be covered in grease and my wife would let me hug her until I'd taken a shower. So I've seen how hard the city makes it, and it makes it even harder for people who, say, only have a high school degree. For someone whose English isn't their first language, they will throw hurdle after hurdle after hurdle in the way. That's why we deserve a mayor who will fight for our future by getting rid of those unnecessary regulations. Also by changing our hiring. Right now, we as a city, if you want to work at some of our rec centers, require a college degree. That's unacceptable. We should be able to have someone, say a veteran, say one of my former soldiers, who's worked at that, you know, that uh, rec center for multiple years. They should be able to apply for a management position there. It shouldn't be just limited to people with a college degree. 
We as a city need to be somewhere acceptable for blue collar workers, young families, and people with high school degrees, and I will do that as mayor. Thank you. Thank you all. Let's see, let's uh, engage in a few more yes, no questions, and we'll start with the Park Hill Golf Course controversy. Please raise your hand if you believe Denver should keep the conservation easement in place and keep this property as a regional park and dedicated open space. Okay, that is Ian DeFoya, Kwame Spearman, Lisa Calderon, and Trinidad Rodriguez want to keep the conservation easement. On the topic, so you might see some variety on this topic. Voting no is, I think, what people want to do. Yeah, I'm voting no. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. And on a related note, uh, raise your hand if you are receiving campaign donations from Westside Investment Partners or any related entities who own the golf course property and are pushing for its development. Anybody? That is nobody. Thank you. Uh, shifting gears, changing subjects, raise your hand, please, if you would seriously consider putting DPS, Denver Public Schools, under mayoral control if it continues to be a troubled district making inadequate progress, especially when it comes to educating black and brown kids. Trinidad Rodriguez said yes. Yes. Thank you. City Council voted in 2021 to ban flavored tobacco products in Denver, a move that was vetoed by Mayor Michael Hancock. Raise your hand if you think flavored tobacco products should be banned in the city and you will pursue that policy if elected. Sure, sure. Uh, city Council voted in 2021 to ban flavored tobacco products, a move that was vetoed by Mayor Hancock. Raise your hand if you think that tobacco pro flavored tobacco products should be banned in the city and you will pursue that policy if elected. Okay. Everyone except for Andy Rougeau, Kelly Ruff, Mike Johnston. Thank you. Last summer, Denver police injured six bystanders during a shooting in Lower Downtown. One of the city's responses was to first ban food trucks outright and later put restrictions on food trucks that still exist that only allow them to be downtown until 9 p.m. Raise your hand if you pledge to bring back food trucks to downtown's late night scene. Okay. Everyone except for Trinidad Rodriguez would bring back food trucks late night in downtown. Trinidad, if you don't mind, could I just get a quick response as to why yeah. not? Well, I, I have to believe that the police actually recommended that kind of action, and I would take the police's advice uh, as it relates to keeping people uh, flooding the streets uh, all at the same time when the bars close. Thank you. This yes no question was suggested by the local chapter of the American Feder Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees Trade Union. Currently, Denver firefighters, sheriff's deputies, and police officers have collective bargaining rights, while more than 10,000 other city employees and employees of locally governed public commissions and authorities lack these basic rights. In addition, almost all county employees in the state, with the exception of combined cities and counties, now have collective bargaining rights. So please raise your hand if you support granting collective bargaining rights to the remaining Denver workers through legislative action. We're about half split. Kelly? Uh, I don't think you can grant it to city through legislative action. And I only know this because I worked for the city when we drafted the charter change that gave collective bargaining to police and sheriffs. So I'm struggling with the... Would you expand the rights to more workers to have collective bargaining? Yeah. Are you in favor? I think That's it has to be yeah. through a vote. It has to be through a vote. Okay. Of the people. That's Are my struggle. Are you in favor of a vote to look into this? I think they have the right to, org they have the right to organize. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we do have union members in our audience this evening, and they are librarians, sanitation workers, janitors, teachers, airport workers, including those who clean the airplanes, who push wheelchairs, and who clean the clubs. Many of these workers in our city might be invisible to some people, but without them, our city would not function. We now have a question suggested by Service Employees International Union, specifically CSEIU, Local 15, and here is the question. 
Support for working people joining unions across the country is at record highs, right? Workers are organizing across industries in Denver, places like Starbucks and in healthcare and at the airport. As mayor, where would you stand on ensuring that city contracts funded by city uh, taxpayer dollars are awarded to responsible union contractors who uphold fair labor practices and provide good jobs with respect and dignity for working families in our community. Uh, we want to start with Andy Rougeau and then go towards Mike Johnson and then we'll go around to Ian and finish off the row. So first to you, Andy Rougeau. So first of all, thank you to all the union workers out here and thank you to the union workers who were essential workers during the pandemic. I was an essential worker during the pandemic. I spent time in Home Depot in May, June, July, pushing carts full of concrete, getting treated like we were lepers when we were dealing with people who were able to order off of Zoom every single day, who didn't interact. So thank you to everybody who kept the city working while that was going on. Now to the question itself. As mayor, I will make sure that we are building as much as possible in the city. I will not add restrictions that will increase the cost of that. I, you know, I'm a former contractor. We built gates for self-storage units. So I know you can have good paying jobs with excellent benefits, unionized or not. Thank you. Thank you. Kwame. So I, I think the city and county of Denver should be an anchor institution. And I think our contract process is a part of that. We need to be putting city resources into our neighborhoods to help incentivize and spur economic activity. And so from a city contract perspective, all options should be on the table. And of course, we should support those types of institutions. And they should be a part of the RFP process. But I think the bigger question is, how can we stimulate Denver? How can we go into our neighborhoods with economic incentives, primarily for local businesses? I want to keep on that point, because what I've noticed around Denver is that our local businesses are dying. And we have to do more to ensure that we keep our cultural flavor of our local economy intact. Kelly? Uh, I served as the head of HR for the city in my career, and I think it's really important that city employees have the right to make a decision about if they should organize, but I feel the same about other employees throughout our region. So I would not add a requirement for a unionized contract only, because otherwise I think I wouldn't be honoring those employees who said no to a union. Um, I would have a contracting process that's fair, um, but I wouldn't add a union requirement. Lisa Calderon. I would absolutely prioritize union contracts, which is why we need all city workers to be unionized without equivocation. We have to repair the harm that was done through the Hickenlooper Hancock years where workers' pay and benefits were gutted. Uh, we, you know, we talk a lot about homelessness. Well, the path to not being homeless are good paying jobs, and specifically, good union jobs. Uh, my grandfather raised 11 children on a good union job as a printer. That has been the pathway to the middle class. It has been the pathway for communities of color, and we have to rebuild that hole, uh, dig out of that hole that we've been in uh, by shortchanging workers. Thank you, Chris Hansen. Yeah, I wanna start with, uh, you know, my position on this issue is very clear because I have been endorsed by the Teamsters. And I'm proud to have the support of the frontline sheriffs who are part of the Teamsters. And it's not hypothetical to me, I'm working right now on legislation to continue the work I've done in the past to make sure when public money is involved that we're using project labor agreements and best value metrics. We need that as part of how we approach public investment. Uh, working on a bill right now with IBEW and the pipe fitters, et cetera, to make sure that as we're doing that at the state level, it's gonna happen, and it's exactly the approach I would take at the city level. Those are great jobs, they strengthen our city, and that's where I would be as your next mayor. Mike. Uh, thank you. I think as the CEO of the city, you have two obligations. One is to make sure your city provides high quality public services to the residents. The second is to make sure you actually do right by the employees that work for the city and set an example as a great employer. That means too often we shouldn't be focused on what the lowest value bid is that comes in to do a project because they're gonna to get to that lowest value by paying their workers the least amount of money. And so I think what we ought to do instead is focus on how do you make sure you're getting best value, which is you're both getting a project built in a high quality way and you're getting it built by paying people a livable wage and paying people livable benefits. And so I think that's what I would prioritize as mayor of the city is making sure we're serving both of those values services and also a fair support of our workers. Okay, Dan Ian. 
Yeah, thank you so much. I actually grew up in a union household. My mom was in the Communications Workers of America when she worked for both Mountain Bell and then US West. She was an operator on the phone. We used to dial zero. Um, and I can remember calling her when I was a little kid trying to ask her what time it was. Um, <laughs> You know, there, what I've been hearing is exactly right. We have to be looking at best value. And I can't imagine a world with the unions that we've worked alongside here in Denver that the best value for any contract wouldn't be to go with a union. That has the best worker standards. They care for their people. I believe what my mother taught me, which is about the collective power of the union. When we fight, we win a better future for ourselves, and that's economic opportunity. As a chair of the Appropriations Committee and on the Joint Budget Committee balancing Colorado's $40 billion budget, uh, we were able to implement uh, the first ever contract with the Colorado State employees uh, with Colorado Wins. It's really important for me that we prioritize our workers in the state of Colorado, and that's what I'll also do in Denver. That includes making sure that we are increasing wages for our workers and our contractors. When it comes to Denver, I think it's important as we think about these hundreds of millions of dollars of infrastructure dollars that are coming in and that are already here. We know they're here. We know that Denver is strong when our unions are strong, when we can rely on the work and the work product that is being done right here in Denver. I 100% believe that when we have city funded, publicly funded dollars, that our union should be at the table to be able to take those jobs and ensure that they are, the jobs are union strong and there are union workers behind them. Thank you, Leslie Harry. Debbie Ortega. So I'm a daughter of a coal miner. My dad was killed on the job. He was a union member. And um, this is very, very close and personal to me, uh, making sure that we always have um, safe work conditions and that I have always fought and will continue to do so. I intend to have a union representative on my cabinet in my administration because I think that relationship between our labor unions and the city is critical and important. One of the things that's killing our city right now, especially in our sheriff's department, is when we moved from, this was under John Hickenlooper's administration, put it on the ballot to ask the voters to take what was the rule of 75 and move it to the rule of 85, which means workers have to now work 10 years longer. So we have sheriffs in our department that are working in their 60s, and it's a, it's a challenging environment. So working with our labor unions is an important part of solving that issue and putting that back on the ballot. P.W. Ortega, and lastly, Trinidad Rodriguez. Yeah, the way these contra uh, procurement processes work is uh, bidders submit a bid that uh, covers many aspects of their proposal to the city. And I would score union labor, uh, union labor more highly um, on that question. Uh, how, uh, at the same time, I'd score, I'd create categories and uh, priorities for workers who invest in their team members that give a greater option for a share of ownership or the dividends of what you work so hard to deliver. So I really appreciate this question. It is, an, it is important to create a full circle uh, between what our city is trying to build for our citizens and what we do for our partners. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, we have a series of questions here. We're back to sort of random order, but not that random. We'll call on you. Uh, 45 second answers on a variety of topics. We'll start with Debbie Ortega. Uh, DIA's chief executive, Phil Washington, pushed forward plans costing more than $1 billion to complete the final phase of the Great Hall project at DIA. This doubled the renovation cost, as you know from being on council, to $2.1 billion and extended the timeline to 2028. Was that a good idea? Why or why not? And what would you do to ensure the timely completion of this very long project? So let me first say that I did not support the Great Hall project in large part because of the time frame and the fact that it went to a Spain, a company from Spain. We had to pay $200 million to get out of that contract. But I think it's important to complete the project the way it was originally proposed, not with giving all the concession dollars to this private company, but making the functionality of getting people through the TSA process quicker and, and my goal is to make sure that we have the most efficient operating airport. And I think we need to focus on the functionality of it and not always the bells and whistles of it. Um, so those are the things that I will work on as the mayor and have a leader that will stay focused on those 
functions. Thank you. Chris Hansen, same question with respect to DIA, the timeline, the management of it. Yeah, the, let's start with, you know, the DIA is the economic engine for this region, not just Denver, not just the Front Range, but the region we live in. It is a huge economic driver for our entire region, and certainly Denver has to perform and deliver a great airport or it hurts us every single day. And so, yes, we can, we can certainly cry over the spilled milk. I mean, I'm upset about what happened with the canceled contract as much as anybody, but we have to deliver a great product, and I'm glad now that we've got a contractor in place and a timeline in place, and we have to stick to it. And as the next mayor, I'll make sure we are done by 2028. We cannot push it another day. Thank you. A question for Leslie Harrod. What is your view of the combined rate of taxes in Denver? Are taxes too high? Are they about right? Or would you push for additional tax funds? And more specifically, would you support additional dedicated taxes such as the College Affordability Fund, the Homeless Resolution Fund, the Caring for Denver Fund that you know something about? Or should these needs be handled through the general fund? Again, as someone who uh, balanced the budget for the state of Colorado, I'll start by saying uh, we do have to, to look under the rug and make sure that our tax dollars are being spent in a responsible way. Number one, uh, we have to dig into every single department and expenditure. I've done that work line by line to make sure we are still doing what works for the people of Denver today. Um, but I'll additionally say that Denver is falling short when it comes to providing certain services. Uh, you mentioned caring for Denver. Yes, I championed caring for Denver, so I do support it. And so did 70% of Denver voters because we know, we know that we're not getting enough mental health and substance use services for people who need it in Denver. Caring for Denver stood in the gap and provided over $100 million for mental health and substance misuse services to 188 organizations in Denver doing the work to build out the infrastructure to truly provide support. I support that. Trinidad Rodriguez, the same question about the tax, tax burden in Denver. Too high, about right, or more resources? The sales tax burden is too high. I agree with many of the programs for which um, dedicated sales taxes have been passed in recent years. I agree we have to scrutinize it to make sure that every uh, benefit is being received by Denver's taxpayers. But as mayor, I will call for a moratorium on future uh, on additional tax sales tax increases initiated by other parties and, or our own administration for five years. Sales tax is the most regressive way to fund these programs. So in actually helping the people who are intended to receive the benefits of many of these programs, we're also uh, cutting against them with a higher tax burden, which they pay a greater proportion of their total income, and that's not right. Kelly Bruff, this question is for you. The time it takes to get almost anywhere in Denver has gone up significantly over recent years. Congestion has become a way of life. What is your plan to get people moving again across the city? And in your mind, are additional traffic lanes part of the problem or are they part of the solution? Yeah. First, you'll be happy to know I'm not going to ask you all to commute on your bike like I do. Um, but it would be good if you want to join me. Um, uh, I, we don't have the land use to continue to add lanes, so what we know, we have to really take advantage of the largest investment we've made uh, in our region, and that's our transit system. So this is going to really require partnership with RTD to improve uh, service delivery and how we uh, move around. That said, I also think it's going to require that we rethink the hub and spoke system with downtown being the hub, given how much our world has changed in the last few years. Uh, I would go neighborhood by neighborhood to ask the question, what does it take to figure out how we more efficiently uh, drive and get around our city? By the way, we are the, one of the top cities in the nation for single occupancy vehicles today. Thank you. Kwame Spearman, same question for you. How are you going to get people moving again? And are extra traffic lanes a, a problem or a solution? You are totally right, Kelly. This is a neighborhood by neighborhood situation. So I look forward to getting your vote since I'm the neighborhood mayor. We have to understand the complexities of our neighborhoods. There are some neighborhoods that are suburban in nature, and those, those neighborhoods are going to continue to have people who are driving. There are other neighborhoods that are incredibly close to our urban core, and we need to really enforce micromobility. Micromobility, excuse me. And in each of those neighborhoods, there are economic incentives that we can offer. I am not as fit as you are, so I do e-bikes because they're easier to get around. And we had an amazing e-bike credit that the city of Denver 
um, that the city of Denver put forward. I, I know I've been very critical of the people who are in office right now, but that was a really, really good thing. And for neighborhoods in which we're trying to have micro-mobility, and neighbors that we're trying to have biking options, we need to put economic incentives in, but at its core, this is a neighborhood-by-neighborhood -neighborhood solution. Kwame Spearman. <clears throat> Mike Johnson, this question is for you. Um, city leaders have tried to revive the 16th Street Mall with a pilot project that gives local entrepreneurs free rent and a stipend to open a store. It's not really working. Some businesses have closed. Uh, one of them shut down because it had to have two people in the store at all time because of safety issues along the 16th Street Mall. The staffing kept profits down, so they had to close. So there's a focus on new entrepreneurship, but what about existing businesses and retail and local existing businesses. What do we do? What as mayor would you do to better help them because they're facing high rent and debt? Yeah, right now we know one of the things we have to do is revive our downtown. Right now we have too many vacant buildings there. And right now, um, especially the 16th Street Mall is a very challenging place to move around. One thing I would do is accelerate the construction project that has now destroyed the entire artery of the 16th Street Mall because it makes it very hard to make it an attractive pedestrian place to go. We can't afford to have it look like that for two years. But I think this is about what do we do to actually incentivize and support a return to commerce downtown. That means, yes, uh, taking on the issue of homelessness, which I addressed earlier, being able to move folks off of the streets and into housing. It also means having more community-based police who are out and visible, walking in the downtown, talking to business owners who will tell me more and more they want to be able to see someone face-to-face -face who they know can answer a question if they have one. And the old high school principal in me knows you walk the halls in advance before the problems begin. That's what people want to do is they want to feel safe downtown and we want to be able to take our kids downtown again and that's what I would do. Thank you, Mike Johnson. Lisa Calderon, let me ask you as well. There's such a push for new entrepreneurship. What about the existing businesses who are struggling right now and need help from the city? What would you do? Well, first we need to stop blaming unhoused people for what's going on downtown and stop uh, perpetuating the myth that more police creates more safety. Um, we need to also stop thinking of downtown as just uh, primarily for corporate businesses and tourists. We really do need to create it as a full uh, neighborhoods downtown that are vibrant, that are easy to uh, walk and roll to. I also think it's a travesty of what's happening to Larimer Street. Um, as a student from MSU, we used to hang out there, and the fact that multinational corporations are buying, uh, buying it up and pushing out small businesses on the watch of the current administration and with partnership with some of the people up on this stage. So um, that's how we would uh, help preserve our small businesses is by protecting them. Lisa Calderon, thank you very much. Ian Tafoya, Denver is more and more becoming a divided city, split between those who have lived here for decades and those who are moving here from all over the country. Um, split between those who are well off and those who are struggling to get by. How do you plan to navigate this divide and be a leader for all? Boy, I really appreciate this question because I come at it all the time when people say, wow, you're native. I'm actually native, being Native American, but I've been here from Denver, Colorado. How I was raised was about calling in all four directions, black, white, yellow, red, elders, youth. Our best solutions come when we accept and celebrate each other's cultures. I'm on the record celebrating people's cultures, both with Historic Denver, trying to teach people who've lived here and don't know people's cultures, but also people who just moved here. What I can tell you is growing up here, they had English as the only language on the ballot. They were trying to ban gay marriage. There's been a lot of change that's been positive about people coming here. We've had more choices in business. There's entrepreneurship. What we haven't had is options in housing. It is very much the basis of what we need to, cause some, to take away some of this divided nature that's occurring. Thank you, Ian DeFoya. I'd like to ask that question to Andy DeRogeau. How do you be a leader for all people in Denver? So when I talk to the people of Denver, regardless of their background, regardless of job, I hear they're frustrated. I hear they're frustrated with rising crime, rising homelessness, and rising cost of housing. That's true regardless of backgrounds. That's why, as mayor, I will fight for our future by adding 400 police officers, by increasing funding for police training, by making sure a 911 system works so everybody's safe, regardless of background, regardless of which neighborhood you live in. I'll make sure we're enforcing our camping ban to get the homeless and the mental health and drug addiction service they need. Because the answer is we're hearing up on the stage that this is a lifestyle choice that should just be okay, that's compassionate to step over someone who's dealing with a mental health issue, who's dealing with a drug addiction issue, is wrong. I'll make sure housing is affordable in our city by making sure blue collar workers, young families, first time home buyers can afford to live here. My name is Andy Rougeau. I'm going to fight for our future and I love your vote. Andy Rougeau, thank you. One final set of yes and no questions. If you're tired with your right arm, you can feel free to use your left here. 
Uh, we'll start with this. Uh, please raise your hand if you think neighborhoods should be more fully notified and consulted before the placement of safe outdoor spaces, shelters in their vicinity. Pardon me, Leslie? Much engaged in the process. Um, I, I haven't seen a safe outdoor space go up where the community has not been very much engaged and very vocal on both sides of whether or not it should be there or not. And so, correct from the local neighborhoods. Where these neighborhoods I think I think that's the point. Uh, and no, 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 I'm saying I've I've heard. We hear that, <laughs> and yeah. I think that it, it's very vocal. In fact, there, is, uh, there was a safe outdoor space in my neighborhood of Park Hill, and we heard a lot from community about whether or not that space should be there in the church parking lot, and eventually the community said yes. So that was eight hands in the air and a questionable hand from, uh, uh, from Ian Tavoy and Leslie Herrick. Can, the, prob can. the problem isn't so much notification, it's the way the city has engaged in community engagement. So the providers have been, done the outreach, the city needs to do a better job with outreach. Okay. Thank you. Raise your hand, please, if you believe that the goal of public policy in Denver should be equality of opportunity and not necessarily equity of outcomes. So that is Mike Johnston, Chris Hansen, Andy Rougeau. Kelly Bruff is raising the issue of whether you can have both. <laughs> I posed it as a one or the other, and the others are not having their hands in the air. Question, right. Is it a question of meritocracy? <laughs> what, what do you let's, mean exactly? There has been a change. We'll stay with this for one second. There's been a change of ethic in this country, you can argue for better or for worse, away from the goal of equality of opportunity and go toward a goal of equity of outcomes. The question is, should equity of outcomes be the goal of public policy in Denver, or should it be equality of opportunity? Opportunity. Right. Right. I think it should be opportunity for us all. That is why we're in the position we are in today. When we said it didn't matter if certain people had access to housing and we drew red lines through our communities. And now we're feeling the impact no matter your race because we haven't thought about equity and truly ensuring that all people have access to opportunity. When your zip code determines your education, your healthcare outcomes, that's not quality of opportunity. That's turning your back on people. And I know that is not Denver. That we, okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Recently, uh, we talked about this shooting a little bit earlier, but recently a grand jury indicted a Denver police officer involved in that Lodo shooting who, that uh, injured six bystanders. That was a decision that Mayor Michael Hancock said he was, quote, surprised by. Raise your hand if you support the grand jury's finding. Okay. Support grand juries. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that, that, is, that is everyone except Andy. Andy Rougeau. I barred. Andy Rougeau. And Debbie Ortega. Okay, thank you. Uh, one last question. Raise your hand if, as mayor, you will commit to finishing the Denver Moves bicycle network, which seeks to put every household in the city <laughs> within a quarter mile of a biking and walking trail. All right, hands up, everyone except for Andy Rougeau. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay. This is not a. <laughs> we are going to move on to our last question for the evening. Final question for the evening. We'll give you 45 seconds in keeping with Auto Inside Out. We try to end with a critical comment and a, and a positive comment. So the question here is, and we will call on people specifically, uh, would you please identify what you see as Mayor Michael Hancock's most significant accomplishment as mayor? along with his greatest failing as mayor. Lisa Calderon, you have the first bite. His most significant accomplishment is motivating me to run for mayor. <laughs> 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 and the other question? <laughs> his greatest failing. His greatest failure is why I'm also running for mayor. <laughs> housing and addressing the homelessness issue. Andy Rougeau. His greatest accomplishment is promoting DIA as a hub from worldwide. His greatest failure is skyrocketing crime and homelessness. Trinidad Rodriguez. 
His greatest accomplishment is navigating the pandemic. Uh, his um, greatest failure and downfall will be uh, is what we've been able to accomplish with for our uh, unhoused residents. Mike Johnston. I, I think they're similar. I think uh, emerging Denver as a world-class city through the Aerotropolis as a place to grow economic impact for the city has been a major accomplishment. I also think it's focus on equity deeply over the last four years has been a major accomplishment. I think the unfinished work is the work of uh, our unhoused community and people we can't afford housing. Thank you. Leslie Herod, highs and lows of the Hancock administration. I'm a fan of the My Denver card, uh, opening all the rec centers uh, for our young people and folks in Denver that, um, that need, need access to these spaces. Uh, I believe that the failure of the Hancock administration today is not meeting the moment. Right now, the administration is not stepping in to meet the challenges of Denver today. That's affordability, that's homelessness, that's crime. They're not meeting the moment. Thank you. Ian Tafoya, you're up. You know, my, the biggest failure, I think, was not listening to me when I developed a plan in the pandemic with people in the community to bring immediate stability when we had access to ARPA dollars and an unemployed workforce that had the expertise to camp people. I also love the My Denver car, but I can't use that one because I used it before and you just used it. I would say the fact is he worked with, his administration worked with the community um, to actually make sure that much of our open space that wasn't zoned to protect open space is, is exactly the thing we're facing off about Park Hill Golf Course right now. If we don't have the zoning in place, they might just build anything they want on it. Kwame Spearman. Access, crime, affordability, but I want to spend a second to actually defend the mayor because we spend so much time trying to polarize ourselves and say, hey, things aren't as good as we want, et cetera. So it is an incredibly tough job. And, and Mayor Hancock has served this city with loyalty and pride and has done things that I think we will remember him for. I agree, I think it was maybe Trini who said this, his response to COVID was amazing. I actually wasn't in Denver while we were responding to COVID. I want to let y'all know, we did an amazing job during the pandemic, given everything that was going on during the pandemic. That was because of Mayor Hancock. And I would encourage all of us, you know, while we're on the campaign trail, like, let's say more positive things about him, right? It's a tough job, and I think you need some recognition. WRK, uh, biggest plus, biggest minus. So I think his work in addressing equity and challenging that, um, implementing it, and challenging our agencies to incorporate that into the work of all of the agencies through the budgeting process and in the work they do through projects and programs. Um, you know, I think some of the, the challenges have absolutely been around housing affordability. I don't think anybody expected our city to grow as rapidly as it has, and we've got a lot more growth yet to come, so we have other challenges that the next mayor is going to have to deal with and make sure that we continue to address affordability as, as one of the major factors. Otherwise, we're going to lose the, um, the diversity that we've had in our city for a long time. Chris Hansen. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I, I think the mayor has done a great job during his 12 years in office of helping to guide and support big projects in Denver. The airport was mentioned, I would agree with that. I think the National Western reinvestment, I think the Convention Center reinvestment, several examples of getting some big projects done they are gonna serve the city well for a very long time. I think the failure that we're seeing right now is the missed opportunities we've had coming out of the pandemic. We had a chance to really accelerate and double down on the momentum that Denver had before the pandemic started. I think we've missed that opportunity. And unfortunately tonight, we spent a lot of time talking about safety, affordability, and the places were falling short. And that's why I'm running for mayor. And Kelly Braw. Uh, I would say I think um, he really did a wonderful job of showing us that uh, you can have emergency response that looks different than always being a police officer uh, with our co-responder program and with our STAR program. And I think his leadership was really valuable there. I think our challenge is housing affordability across the entire spectrum. Um, and I, I would also add, though, I really appreciate uh, some of the things that have happened in the last 12 years because I think it gives us a roadmap about what doesn't work and some tough lessons. So I'm even grateful for that because I think we're positioned to be able to take that on and address it better in the future. Okay. Trudana? I yield a little bit of my time. I'm 
realizing we were using the timer for this question. So if oh. I could just add, oh. with respect to uh, the unhoused challenge that the uh, mayor has much more work to do, I'm actually very encouraged that he's doing what I'm suggesting, which is exploring the ability to use involuntary commitment for uh, people living unhoused on our streets who are of danger to themselves and others. Okay, thank you very much, Trinidad Rodriguez. Thanks to you all for your thoughts, your ideas, and for bringing some clarity to some of the talking points we had. So we appreciate all of that. Thank you very much. Um, that is all the time we have for this evening. But I know this conversation will continue. I hope it continues for the people of Denver to get to know all the candidates who will be, who are running to be our 46th mayor. Oh gosh, big job ahead of you guys to convince everybody that you are the one. I wanna thank you all for making the time tonight. I wanna thank my colleagues, Elena and Eric for bringing such a thoughtful conversation to the table. Thanks to our PBS 12 crew who worked so hard. Also to our partners for this evening, ASME, S-E-I-U, Local 105, and the Colorado Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. We appreciate all everyone's input. The forum can be rewatched and shared anytime on pbs12.org, and we'll make sure to talk about it coming up on Colorado Inside Out Friday night, that is for sure. Um, thank you all for watching, and uh, look for your ballots coming in the mail in just a couple of weeks, and then go vote for our city's next mayor. Thank you. <laughs>